very, very, very grateful to be together today on this Memorial Day weekend. Uh, lots of things to give thanks for, not just those who gave their lives, but the one who gave his life for all of us as we celebrate him this morning. And again, welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We're in Acts chapter 12 uh, today for uh, this message that is titled, Peter's Miraculous Escape from Prison. Uh, it's if you have the NIV, that's how the chapter 12 is headed in your NIV translation. Uh, Peter's miraculous escape from prison. A great way to make the point of what this chapter is all about. And underneath that, it says, man, human beings, man can't make a prison for which God doesn't already hold the key. There's no lock. He, he doesn't even have to crack a lock. He's already got the key for whatever the lock is to open it because he's God. And he uh, he came to set people free. Years ago, some of you remember this. I kind of enjoyed this show the times I watched it. There was a TV show called Prison Break. Does anybody remember that from several years ago? It's a great series. I forget how many years it ran. It was a creative and captivating uh, series of episodes showing how two brothers, one who was all tattooed up with the the, the plan of escape, how two brothers were planning to pull off a seemingly impossible escape from prison. And then there's the greatest movie of all time. No, I'm just kidding, but it's one of my favorites, The Shawshank Redemption. How many of you are familiar with that movie? It's also the story, right, about a prison break that is uh, planned for a long time, and it took a long time to execute it. But a guy who was falsely charged, this is fiction, but it's a, it makes for a great story, falsely charged with murder, uh, breaks out of this prison. Uh, so, that, yeah, that's called the Shawshank Redemption. And both the TV show and that movie can be seen as great illustrations of the longing of every human heart to be free. That's why prison is such a painful thing for people, right? We are not made to be locked up. We are made to be set free. And uh, it's a beautiful uh, image of that, uh, that every, everyone who's incarcerated does not want to be there. And any person who's bound in any way in their heart of hearts does not want to be there. Most of you know that a good brother who's become a good friend of mine, is, is this is real life, is serving a life sentence in Florida for murdering his wife's ex-husband. He's not trying to escape. He's resolved to living with the consequences of the choice he made that terrible day. While God could free him from the rest of his sentence, God could. That's probably not how he's going to get out, but... And I know his name's Jason. He and I have talked about this. One day his sentence will end, and he will be free. <laughs> right? He's gonna when when he dies in some federal penitentiary in Florida. When that day comes, and he dies having been locked up his whole life, he was 26 when he did this. Uh, he will find the ultimate freedom that he's always been longing for, that he knows is already his. Can you imagine the first time he doesn't take a breath inside a prison, he'll be, he'll be in the presence of God and then forever. So he's going to get out. He's just not going to escape the way uh, that TV show and that movie showed it happening. But he'll be, he'll be in the presence of the Lord. He is right now in a real way too. Uh, you'd love him. One day you'll meet him. Uh, so the theme for this morning's message is Peter, Paul, and Silas. Peter, Paul, and Silas. I should emphasize it that way. Peter was by himself. Paul and Silas together, had similar stories to tell about how, get, how God came through for, for them while they were imprisoned. And you know why Peter was imprisoned and why, why Paul and Silas were imprisoned? Because they knew and loved God and were walking with him, and some people didn't like that. The application is this. No one can do anything that stops God from being able to come through for you. Nobody can do anything to you or in your life that will be uh, that will prevent God from getting to you wherever you are and whatever that situation is. Isn't that comforting? Isn't that we could just park there for a couple minutes and and just thank Him? There's nothing that anybody can do, including yourself. You, you, the totality of your poor choices doesn't doesn't can't keep God from getting to you. It just can't. And here's the focus. Two weeks ago, we looked at the account of God's supernatural intervention concerning a situation Paul and Silas found themselves in, recorded in Acts 16. If you remember, their incarceration for cutting off the income from a female slave who, through an unclean spirit, quote, earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling, that was short lived. But this wasn't the first time God broke one of his own out of prison. <laughs> Paul and Silas' story is a classic example of deja vu all over again. As you read the book of Acts straight through, 
you'll see the first recorded prison break isn't in Acts 16 with Paul and Silas. It's in Acts 12 with Peter. And it's an incredible account. In Acts 12, Peter experienced a similar prison break, magnificently orchestrated and miraculously brought about by God. While Paul and Silas experience an earthquake, followed by invisible hands removing chains and opening doors, Peter experienced an angel waking him up, followed by invisible hands removing chains and opening doors. Those are the two similarities. In a Venn diagram, that would be in the middle there. Uh, uh, invisible hands uh, removing chains and invisible hands opening doors. Paul's unique, uh, Paul and Silas' unique uh, experience include an earthquake where everybody was set free, every prison door opened. But in Peter, it's an angel that comes. And listen, he is locked down in that prison. But an angel comes and busts him out. So... Uh, may we learn from Peter's experience this morning. Uh, may what we learn from Peter's experience comfort and, com and compel us today. That's certainly the prayer. So turn with me there to Acts chapter 12, and uh, we'll read the first 11 verses and then uh, 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 address this first point. So this is per Peter's miraculous escape from prison. Acts chapter 12, we're going to read through, uh, through uh, verse 11. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. Here's an important detail. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover, which means his fate was going to be the same as that of James. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying for God, to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. That being what? His death. And so here's the first point of this, of this message. When it comes to any earthly prison, literal or figurative, when it comes to any earthly prison, not one of them, he could do it without an earthquake. He can do anything, anytime, any way, anywhere concerning anyone he wants. He's God. So this passage reminds us that being right with God, and as you look at those first verses, you see this so clearly. This passage reminds us that being right with God sets us at odds with those in the world who are still at odds with and in hellish rebellion towards him. Some people are in a hellish rebellion toward God. They hate him. They mock him. They, they resist him. They deny he even exists, which is like a fish saying, I'm not wet. Uh, uh, that, th no matter where that person is, what this tells us is if we are right with God, that makes us wrong with everybody who's currently wrong with God and has no desire to be right. And there are some important details here we mustn't overlook, starting with the, that, the beginning in verses 1 through 4. What a brutal context into the situation in which Peter found himself. Put yourself in his place. King Herod had already been arresting people and, to persecute them, and he had already had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. Can you imagine being next in line? That's what Peter was. Many had been arrested, many had been persecuted, 
And James had been killed with a sword. And now Peter's on deck. So the context of this is very, very, very intense. Uh, and if you put yourself in Peter's place, one of the things that is absolutely staggering is you look at verses 5 and 6. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. That's going to be one of the main parts of the second point. But the church was praying for him. And I don't know if you caught it as I read it or if you've ever seen it when you've read it. But look at verse 6. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, where he knew he would be accused and put to death. That's the implication. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. Would you sleep that night if you knew what was coming in the morning? Just, just that picture of Peter sleeping screams without saying a word. It's okay. I'm okay. I'm his. He's with me. He knows I'm here. And unbeknownst to Peter, that the church was praying, and uh, it, it, it says earnestly praying. It wasn't, let's get together, pray for a few minutes, and go have a meal. No, 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 no. They were with Peter in that prison. They were praying for him to get out. And uh, again, clearly, the night before Herod was to bring him to, to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. I'm sure there's not a comfortable position in which to sleep when you're chained up. I'm sure as you're falling asleep, you're acutely aware of the people who are watching over you, right by you, who are there to make sure you don't get out. And what was Peter doing? Sleeping. And I'll bet you that, at least I sense it to be, just very peacefully. I, I don't know. Again, put yourself in that situation. Do you think you'd even be able to fall asleep when you know what's coming the next day? There's a part of me that wonders if I'd, if I'd be able to do that. Unless I was totally exhausted, I'd be, I'd be thinking about the next morning. Peter apparently was just, he knew him. He, maybe Peter remembered after he totally blew it. Jesus had breakfast with him and said, it's okay. You know, this is the Peter who had rejected Christ. And earlier, this same Peter, who would have been the one somebody from the outside looking in might have picked, he became the keynote preacher at Pentecost. The same guy who just a few weeks before that had denied he even knew Jesus. And then he, uh, he gave that sermon of sermons in Acts chapter 2. That's who's sleeping between these soldiers. That's mind-blowing to me that he was able to be sleeping. How in the world could he be sleeping knowing what he knew um, that was just made known to us as we read those first four verses? And again, verse 4 clearly indicates Herod's preoccupation was in Peter not being able to escape. Again, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each, 16 people guarding him. Uh, Herod intended to bring him out for public trial uh, after the Passover. That was what his intention was. So Herod went out of his way, according to that verse, to make sure, absolutely, as totally as he could be, that Peter isn't going to escape. Well, here's the problem. Herod didn't figure on, nor could he have come up with a way to keep God out. Maybe Peter's not going to get out, but God's going to get in. And that's just so beautiful. Right in the midst of all those probably big guys that are watching over Peter, God comes in, cloaked in an angel, right? It wasn't really God himself, but God sent that angel right through everything that Herod set up so Peter couldn't get out. The angel got right through all of that to Peter in that place, right inside the cell. Oh, that's amazing and beautiful. God broke into the prison, even though Peter couldn't break out. And it's kind of funny when you uh, when you look at verse 7. The, the, this just really struck me. Well, and I love the word, suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the prison cell. 
So suddenly the angel's right there and the cell is filled with light. Did the light wake Peter up? No, apparently he was sleeping pretty soundly. I mean, think about that. If you're in the middle of some dark prison and all of a sudden light came into the cell, you might you think it might wake you up. No, apparently he was sleeping so soundly. It wasn't the light that woke him up. The angel, you know, the angel gave him one of these. You know, get up. And so you and it's you know, Peter's describing how how he wasn't even sure if it was a dream or it was a vision he was seeing. But just again, just think about that. He's so peacefully sleeping that light coming into the cell doesn't wake him up. The angel has to bump him and tell him to get up. That just seems kind of funny to me, that, that that's how that this happened. You would think Peter would immediately wake up when the light came into the cell, or at least I would. The angel had to hit him to wake him up. And then the description of how it hap actually happened follows, which is captivating. And again... The older I get, the more I want to, to uh, not just blow by, but acknowledge and embrace and wonder and wrestle with and like think about the details that God gives us. Listen, in verse 8, the angel said to him, put on your clothes and your sandals, and Peter did so. I'm just telling you, I think it's quite possible that he was buck naked. I really do. That would maybe want to keep you from getting up and running around or going somewhere. But when it clearly says, put on your clothes and sandals, that means they weren't on his body. And if he wasn't buck naked, all he had on was whatever the undies were that day. No clothes. He, was, he, he, he didn't have any clothes on. So the angel tells him, get dressed. We're not going out like this, you know. And so Peter, and then it clearly says, and Peter did so, and then he says, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And then Peter followed him out of the prison. He had no idea what the angel was doing, uh, that, that what the angel was doing was real. And then listen, they passed the first and second guards. Now these guards should have been awake. How did they get past them? Would you stand between somebody and an angel? Who knows how this angel appeared? Or, 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 if, or if there's just some kind of cloaking device that God put on them as they who we don't know. But these guys were, and we'll see at the end, their life is on the line. They can't let this this escape happen. And and it just simply but very clearly says they passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate of the prison that led out to the city, and the iron gate opens in front of them. No sensors. Nothing electronic. Very similar to Acts 16 in the, in the sense that the, the prison doors just open. Now the, the huge gate that leads to the city just swings open. You can only imagine, Peter, like, is this a vision? Is this a dream? What is going on? And then, which is fascinating. And they went through it. And then look at the, the very uh, last part of verse 10. When they'd walked the length of one street. Now you would think Peter would be pretty comfortable having an angel as a bodyguard. And maybe Peter's thinking, he's going to take me the distance. To, I don't know where, but uh, I like this angel. But look what it says in verse 10. When they walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Suddenly the angel appeared. Suddenly the angel left him. And what did Peter do? Did he freak out? No. He came to himself. And then he acknowledged what God had done. Isn't that fascinating to read and, and to really wonder and wrestle with? Now, we just got the descriptions of what happened, but how did that, what did that look like? How much time did it take? And again, I'm, it just struck me as I was preparing for this earlier this week, I would at least think it's possible that he didn't have a stitch of clothing on him while he's laying there in that prison, chained up, cold, dreary. But again, the point being, there's nothing a person can do that will keep God from getting to who he intends to get to. Nothing anybody can do can stop him from getting to anybody. It's very, very comforting to know that. And uh, so, uh, and when we get to verse 11, after the angel leaves him, um, you know, you might think he's, he, he, uh, he's wondering, uh, now that he's out, now that he's clothed, now that he's all by himself again, um, we, you don't have to imagine uh, what he was thinking. We're told specifically what he was thinking right after the angel left in verse 11. Peter came to himself and said, Now I know 
without a doubt that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. Peter knew that God sent that angel to spare his life. It wasn't time for his life to end. So God got him out. And there, as again, as I read verse 11, there's no sense of panic. He just realized that God came through. And then we'll read, starting in verse 12, how this uh, winds up. So again, the first point this morning, or this afternoon or this evening, is this. When it comes to any earthly prison, prison, literal or figurative, not one of them can keep God away from who's ever inside. And the second point this morning is this. When it comes to any earthly prison, prayer is the key that moves the hand of the one who holds all the keys. Prayer becomes our key to have the key keeper come with his key to unlock whatever the situation is. And it's prayer that does that. Uh, again, uh, verses, uh, uh, verse, verse 5, the, the end of verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison, and this, this right here is what changed everything. It was the catalyst for what we read following that. But the church was earnestly praying to God for him. And then we see God's answer to, that, to their prayers. Right there. So verses 12 through, uh, um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll read through 19. 12 through 19, that should say 19, not 18. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. This is where they were at. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. Now again, put yourself in Peter's place. Open the door. You know, she's so excited. It's like, you know, he's, he's answered our prayers. Well, yes, but, so let him in is the point. But she was so excited she went back and she said, Peter is at the door. Now listen to these verses, to these words. You're out of your mind, they told her. It's like, he can't be out of prison. We're praying he'll get out. That's, that's, that's the, the reality here. It can't be Peter. We're praying he gets out of prison. God's answered the prayer, let him in again. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking. I would have too, right? Wouldn't you? <laughs> I want to get in. Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. And then Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And then listen to Peter's words here. Tell James and the brothers about this. Get this information to my brothers, to my fellow disciples. Because they don't know this yet. We can't text them. <laughs> Go tell them. And then he left for another place. You've just found refuge and now you're going back on the street? This guy's bold. He goes in there. He tells them what happened. He says, tell James and the brothers about this. And then he left for another place. And then it concludes with this. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. After Herod had a thorough search made for him and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. These are the guys they just walked right by. This gives understanding to Acts 16 when the jailer was going to take his own life, doesn't it? I, I'm going to do this instead of the Romans getting to me because if I die at the Romans' hand, it's going to be a long, painful death. They knew that if Paul and Silas broke out, that this jailer would, would experience the same fate that happened just before Paul and Silas. He cross-examined the guards. This is Herod, and he ordered that they be executed. You failed your mission. So, 
Prayer is the key that moves the hand of the one holding the keys. And underneath that it says, straight from verse 5, but the church was earnestly praying. And this is a reminder to us that the first line of offense is prayer. Prayer brings the answers and the results only God can give and accomplish. Prayer moves the hand as it touches the heart of the one who can do what needs to be done. That's what prayer does. He doesn't always do it the way we think he should in the time frame or, or how he brings about the deliverance or the healing or the, the, the freedom. But, but, but prayer does touch his heart and then moves him to do what needs to be done on the behalf of the one we're praying for. And again, this is even even though it's not always said, it's it's got to it's got to rest on the foundation of nevertheless not my will but yours be done. I I can't pray perfectly. All, none of us can pray perfectly, but God can answer every imperfect prayer perfectly. So it may not be the way we think it should be. It may not go the way we think it should go, but that doesn't mean God's not answering it. And that doesn't mean that God's not as, as much involved in it right now as He's. He, you're going to know he was when you see the answer come. But the church was earnestly praying. The first line of offense is prayer. It brings, I'll say it again, answers and results that only God can give and accomplish. And here in Acts 12, we see some amazing things happen and some humorous moments, not the least of which is when Rhoda goes running back without opening the door. And so there is a lot to see in this final passage. The takeaway of the whole second point, and I, you could even argue the entire passage of this miraculous escape, is this that prayer is important. Prayer is important. We've heard this many, many times. Little prayer, little power, some prayer, some power, much prayer, much power. That God, God, God meets with those who wait on him. And a, a prayerless church is an impotent church. A prayerless person becomes impotent concerning the power from God that is needed to do what needs to be done. Uh, Jim Simbola, who uh, he and his wife Carol, many of you know the story of the Brooklyn Tabernacle. Um, they, their, their, whole, their, their whole premise of this church, because where they were, there's no way you can plant a church that's going to grow in Brooklyn in the area they planted that church if God doesn't lead and have his way. So much darkness. And their they kept track of who was there on Sunday. And they discipled and taught and, and instructed and, and, and did what every local body of believers should do. But for Jim and Carol, the way they measured the blessing of God in that church wasn't on Sunday morning, it was Tuesday night. How many came for prayer? Most churches, you announce a prayer meeting, you can hear the crickets chirping. You invite some well-known artist in, charge 30, 40 bucks a ticket, you'll fill the place. Call for a prayer meeting. Oh, I'm busy. They're boring. And I remember, some of you know I was there, I think it was 2013, and I was there on a Tuesday night for the prayer meeting. And we had an afternoon session. We went out for dinner. We came back. The prayer meeting started at 7. They opened the doors at 5.30. We came back a little, a little, uh, a little after four, and there was already a line at least two blocks long, waiting to get in to pray, because God answered prayer in that place. And and on a Tuesday night, that particular Tuesday night, there were only fourteen hundred, uh, a little over fourteen hundred of us that had come for the event there, and and the 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 auditorium seats probably I, I would guess five thousand. It was packed, and there was an overflow room where people went and prayed in the overflow room, a prayer meeting on a Tuesday night. People would come straight from work and stand in line. They had food you could get there because they knew people needed to eat. They, they had just prepared for a lot of people every Tuesday night because a lot of people came every Tuesday night because prayer is the key that moves the hand of the one holding all the keys. Prayer is an important part of, should be an important part of our life. And I want to, I want to highlight this, uh, just a couple more things. In, uh, 
in verse 15, of course, this is, this is significant. They're praying, they're, they're asking, and then God answers their prayer, and she's so excited she doesn't even let them in, and they're thinking there's no way this can happen, no four squads or four soldiers, Herod, they're going to kill him if he gets out, and uh, they say to her, you're out of your mind. They tell the girl who has just heard from Peter on the other side of the door, she's out of her mind. And then she kept insisting that it was so, and they said, now let's, let just listen to this with fresh ears as though you had no idea of what was going on. She said, or, or they said, it must be his angel. And nobody said, Rhoda, you always hyper-spiritualize everything. No, that's not, that was not their response. There was no response. Apparently they were cool with that. What does that mean? It must be his angel. Scriptures say that every child has an angel that watches over them. God calls us his children. I don't know. But think about that. They said to her persistence that Peter's outside the door right now, they, they just didn't have any framework. They, 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 couldn't, they couldn't process the fact it can't be him. So they were okay by saying, well, then it must be his angel. And again, for me, that is staggering to ponder. That nobody said that's weird or that's just stupid. They were okay with her saying that must be his angel. As though that was part of their framework in the world in which they lived. Um, for whatever that's worth, I'm just acknowledging that's what they said. And they were wrong. It wasn't his angel. It was him. And so when they saw him, what does the scriptures, I don't know what translation you have, but the word that's used here in the NIV is that they were astonished. And then it blows my mind what Peter does. He basically hushes them. Don't want to draw any attention to where we're at or where I'm at because they still want, he still wants me dead. And so he does what he does, he says what he says, and then he leaves. And again, we see... But the result of that, of course, there was no small commo commotion. You can just imagine Herod just stomping like, there's no way you let him get out. There's no way you could let him get out. How did he get out? And he was ra undoubtedly raging, just raging. That was his, that's how he rolled. And uh, nope, he's gone. Don't know where he is. And then Herod said, okay, you're dead. All of you are dead. Just like that. He was wicked. But Peter was safe. Peter was free. And as you read the rest of the book of Acts, you realize he continued to, to do ministry in a way that, that rocked the world and even finds its way to us somehow or another today. Um, so yeah, it just quietly says at the end of that uh, 17th verse, he left for another place. doesn't even say where. Again, because he's still a wanted man. And Herod wanted to find him so he could kill him. But God saw to it that that's not going to happen today. Isn't that encouraging? <laughs> Super encouraging. Nobody's going to get to you unless God lets them get to you. And if somebody's gotten you and you're not where you're supposed to be, he'll get to you. He'll get to you and he'll get you out. He'll provide. He'll guide. He'll do whatever it takes because he can. There's nothing, nothing, nothing that he can't do. And so again, uh, it's uh, verses 18 and 19 at the end of this. I think I already said it. Yeah, I did. That explains why, why the jailer in Acts 16 was going to take his own life, right? Because what, what happened to these guys was going to happen to him. That's what he thought, if anybody escaped. And then that's as we looked at that a couple of weeks ago, it's such a beautiful thing. Peter's like, no, no, no. the same guy. And it's, it's Peter who, who, who pulls out his sword, clearly. In, in, in the garden before he's arrested, the same guy who pulled out his sword he tells, tells, uh, tells uh, the jailer to sheath his sword because we're still here. And that's just, again, a beautiful part of that story that they were totally set free, but they didn't leave. And then you know what happened that night. That jailer and his family were baptized and they believed. That's just so beautiful. So years ago, there was a situation that, that I wasn't made of made aware of here at this church in the early days of this church. 
And uh, I'll spare the details, but I'll, I'll say this because it was in my office where this happened. Um, because I realized the, the severity of, of what was about to transpire. And um, let me just read what I wrote so I don't go too far and, and, and uh, give away any details. Um, years ago, there was a severe situation of which I was made aware. It was intense. It was going to be painful to address. There was no telling how it would go. And I made a promise to the person who contacted me that I would be praying on I, until I heard from this person about what the result was. And again, look at that. Uh, look at and listen to this second point. Prayer is the key that moves the hand of the one holding, holding all the keys. And so I told this person, I will be on my knees in my office. This person told me that they were going to go address this situation. So I told this person, I will be on my knees in my office until the phone rings. However long it is, I'll do my best to be there however long it is. Whether it's a couple minutes or a few hours, I will not stop praying until I hear from you. And I was on my knees in my office, not knowing how this was going to go, not, not knowing if, uh, not knowing. I'm just saying this was a severe situation. About 45 minutes later, the phone rang, and I hear this person's voice on the other line. And uh, I'm thinking, because it, it, it could have gone really bad, I'll just say that. And I'm just, I just said, it's good to hear your voice. And he said, thanks for praying. I think it's going to be okay. And he hung up. And, and I share that because I know, it's not, not because I was praying, it's because somebody was praying, interceding on behalf of him and the person he needed to go to, to, to see that, just God, please have your way. And guess what? He did. And all those many years ago, this situation was exposed, was, a, was addressed, and, and now there's, they're healed and they're whole. It's just a beautiful story. And I experienced in a fresh way um, how important prayer is and how grateful I was for the opportunity to intercede for this person in that situation. Because though I, you know, just having only been here a few years, I don't know that I was that confident. I don't know that I'm that confident now. But I, I'm, I, know, that I, I know that my confidence in God uh, is enough. It's just enough. And so with that in mind, here's the making it real questions. First point, when it comes to any earthly prison, not one earthly prison can keep God away from who's ever inside that prison. The, the first question is this, how sure are you of this? Do you really believe that that's true? There's nothing that can keep God from getting to somebody. And why do you think that is? On the scale of 1 to 10, how sure are you that God can get to anybody anytime no matter what the situation is. Why do you think that is? And if you have a strong confidence that you really do believe that God can get to anybody, anytime, it's because he's come through for you. You have experiential knowledge, don't you? God has answered your prayers. You've seen him do this. And I hope that's all of our stories. And then the second question connected to that second point, when it comes to any earthly prison, prayer is the key that moves the hand of the one holding all the keys. In what ways does this encourage you to pray more often? And the action step is pondering the significance of Acts 12, 5 through 6, which says, So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Pondering the significance of those two verses, especially as they pertain to the church praying while Peter is sleeping, write down a prayerful response to both of those, both of those verses. I hope, I hope you see the juxtaposition of the church was praying and Peter was sleeping. He was at peace. He wasn't afraid. And in fact, again, he was sleeping apparently so soundly that a light Flood, that a room, that a cell flooded with light didn't even wake him up. The angel had to whack him. <laughs> he was sleeping that soundly. So, 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 so there's your action step. And again, brothers and sisters and fellow strugglers, I don't know much, 
But when I hear a passage like this, I am reminded that God is able. God is always able to accomplish whatever concerns us. The diagnosis, the prognosis, the the excruciatingly painful situation or relationship or whatever, whatever it is, there's nothing going to lock you up that God can't get to you and do whatever needs to be done. And I hope that we take that to heart in a fresh way today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this good day. Thank you once again for, once again, bringing us together to praise and to worship you, to hear from your word, and to give thanks. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for rescuing us. You really are our all. You really are the best. You really are our joy and righteousness, and we love you. And Holy Spirit, we ask you to fill us fresh today, not unlike the way you did with Jesus' first followers in the upper room that day in Jerusalem. As they did, we want to live the risen life in the power only you can provide. Make us bold and lead us forth in Jesus' name. Thank you for the many answered prayers you've granted among us. Help us remember that prayer really is the key that moves your hand, which is always holding all the keys. Increase our prayer life in, its, in the time spent and the passion we bring. We're not just talking to the air. And it's not, this, it's not just the universe we're asking questions about or to. We're praying to you who made the universe, who made us and everyone and everything. And God, as we think about Memorial Day tomorrow here in the United States, help us to be mindful of how holy this holiday is. With their lives, they could only give once. Others paid the price for the freedoms that we enjoy today. And in that, they remind us of you. We honor and remember them even now. We pray for the families for whom tomorrow is going to be a hard day. Comfort them. And again, help us be grateful with a deep gratitude and a true reverence for all it's taken for us to be alive today. And finally, we rest, God, while we wrestle, knowing that in the middle of whatever battle we're in or how severe the struggle has been or how long it's been, we know that right now you are in the process of making everything new. And we trust you for that. And we thank you together in Jesus' mighty, mighty name. Amen. Here's the benediction. Go now with an abiding gratitude for God's audacious love for you, his amazing grace to you, and his awesome presence with you everywhere and always.